Answer me this question. Who, uh, who was the main villain in the movie, uh, in the Avengers movie? Thanos. Who? All right, we got a picture. There you go, Thanos. That's Thanos. All right. All right, who, how about this one? Who was the main villain, uh, like, in the Batman movies? Joker. 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 I know that one. Right. All right. That one. All right, those are, those are easy ones. All right, who was the main villain in the Harry Potter movie? Voldemort. Yeah, but what was his name, really? Who? He who must not be named. Who? Tom Riddle. Right. There you go. See, I, I stumped you on that one. Yeah, Tom Riddle. Well, through, really, that was Lord Voldemort. Anyway, now we can stay here all night sort of playing this game of, of who, you know, who played the main villain, uh, named that villain, because really every story, right, every movie, right, has one. Right, in some shape or form, some person, some force, or whatever. But we're going to come back to that in just a minute. Um, I kind of want to just catch this up real quick. We're going to be in Nehemiah 4 tonight. Um, let's talk a little bit about where we've been so far. All right, in the first three chapters, we've, um, we've seen passion and prayer. Um, we've seen plans and preparation. And we've seen the people of Nehemiah come together. Um, we've seen, we've been brought, as we've gone through this to the moment, where this thing that Nehemiah... Um, set out to do is going to happen. All right. I mean, now he's in Jerusalem, um, and not only has he rallied the people together, he's inspired them to take action, and really, they're all in. Okay. So if Nehemiah if he just ended here, I mean, it would be a pretty, pretty epic story, right? I mean, we could say, man, this is pretty awesome, right? Look what God did uh, through His faithfulness. Right. He, he, saw, um, he, he broke Nehemiah's heart. Right, for the, the stuff that had happened in Jerusalem and to the wall, he put, his, put him on his face in prayer. Uh, and then he answered his prayers right, with regard to the king that he had to face and asked if he could leave to go build the wall. All right, now if we look at Nehemiah, here he is in, his, in Jerusalem. He's putting his plan into action, and the wall is about to go up. But if we ended it there, if we just stopped with this chapter, see, then we would be misled about what actually took place after this. Right? We get the idea, in some ways, right, that if God burdened us with something, put some passion on our heart, you know, for whatever it is, it has to be built a wall, but for something, right, like that he's just going to work it all out. And while God, I mean, he will do that, right, but, but there's a whole other part of the story that we miss out on. If we just stop with this part of the story, Right, we get the idea that everything ought to just be smooth sailing from here on out. But see, then right, we run head on into Nehemiah chapter 4. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. We're going to start with the first three verses. Now when Samballot heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria... What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones in that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. I want to get a kick out of this. Kind of a, I don't know, kind of a weak sort of a jab. He said, yes, what are they building? Even if a fox goes up on the wall, he'll break down their stone wall. <laughs> uh, I mean... I know what he's getting at, which is kind of a, a weak sort of attempt, I thought. <laughs> anyway, all right. like we said, every story has a villain, okay? And here in chapter 4, we meet uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, all right? But what I want to do is I want to put these two guys on the shelf for a minute, and I want to look at a few of the passages here in chapter 4, because again, um, we could definitely take some leadership principles uh, uh, away from how Nehemiah reacts, uh, but I still think it's better uh, if we first connect this to the bigger story, the bigger picture of what God's doing. Now, there's a few passages of Scripture in chapter 4 that will point us really to a pretty large theme uh, that we see all throughout the Bible, all right? It's, it's what we call, you ready for it? The sovereignty of God and human responsibility. Boy, don't all, I know y'all are excited about that. Before your eyes glaze over, all right, I, I want to talk a little bit about this because, there's a, like I said, it's a very important theme all throughout Scripture. Um, and, and there's some important things I think we can take away from this um, that really help us uh, as Christians. So, 
All right, we're going to pick it up in verse 7. So sovereignty of God and human responsibility. All right, verse 7. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites uh, and the Ashadites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. All right, verse 9. And we prayed to our God and set guard, a guard as protection against them uh, day and night. So they prayed to God and they set the guard as protection. But here's my question. If God is sovereign, why do both? If God is sovereign, why pray and set the guard? Why do both? Okay, now while you think about that, let me see if I can give you an illustration. Now, fast forward into, into the book of Acts, chapter 27. Paul's put in the boat as a prisoner with some other prisoners, um, and they're all being taken to Rome. Now, while they're on this, uh, a boat, this big storm comes up, uh, and the seas start to rage. Now, in the middle of all this, um, an angel appears to Paul and tells him, look, even though the ship's going to be lost, nobody's going to die. All right, not one person will die. All right, so what Paul does is he tells everybody on the ship what, what he's just been told. Okay, but this storm, like, I mean, it just continues to rage. And they have, they're, they're trying to throw stuff off the side. They're doing everything they can. Well, as it continues to go, the other crew and the prisoners start getting nervous. And so they sneak over to this lifeboat and they start to lower it down. All right, well, Paul finds out about it and he runs over to the commander of the soldiers and he says, Look, man, you've got to keep everybody on the boat. If you don't do that, we're all going to die. And you read that and you go, well, wait a minute. Why didn't Paul say, well, you know what? I mean, God promised nobody would die, so I don't care. Do some cannonballs and backflips off the boat. It really doesn't matter. I mean, go snorkeling for all, for all I care because we're all good, right? I mean, what, what does it really matter? God said nobody was going to die. Take the lifeboat or, or don't take it. Either way, who cares? But instead, Paul says, look, man, we've got to stay on the boat. See, God's in charge. He's sovereign. But what we do matters. Let me say that again. God is in charge. He is sovereign. But what we do matters. And there's a lot. It sounds kind of illogical when you think about it, but there's a lot of freedom for us in that at the heart lived level. There's a lot of freedom in that for us because it means, I talked a little bit about this last week, no matter what I do, right, I'm not going to, um, no matter what I pray for, I'm never going to screw anything up so bad that God is going to say, now what? I'm not going to somehow thwart God's plan, right? And sometimes, probably really more like often, my prayers won't get answered because what, I, what I'm asking for is not necessarily what God deems a part of his pleasing and perfect will because he knows better than I do. I mean, if you don't believe that, and not all of you in here, are, you know, you guys in here, think back to your eight-year-old self, you know, and the things that you kind of did and thought about. And you're like, and that was really silly, right? Well, then when you get to be 20, you look back at your 15-year-old self and go, man, I thought I had it all figured out, but, you know, I don't think I did. And then we, you know, you get older, your 30-year-old self looks back at your 20-year-old self, right? And so forth and so on. We can go on and on with all this. But, I mean, we can look back at the choices, right? I mean, we look back at some of the, some of the girls or some of the guys we try to go after, and we go, Woo! <laughs> Thank you for not answering that prayer. <laughs> right? I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Okay, anyway. <laughs> but yes. we look back, and we realize... And I didn't know what I was asking for. Sometimes, sometimes people, they move, and you don't want to move. And it really tugs at your heart because you're like, well, this is the place I know, but you don't realize what God's got in store for us. Look, to be honest with you, I, I know me. 
And, and I think we, we have to consider the fact that we honestly think the choices that we very often make with how twisted our hearts get, that we should be ultimately in charge of all this, that our prayers, uh, although they, when we send them up, God hears them and he uses them, but we're not going to change what God's going to do overall. And, and I know me, and I take a lot of comfort in that, because if, if that's the case, man, we are in serious trouble. Because I prayed for some things that were pretty daggum stupid that I found out later. So God is sovereign, right? And what we do matters. Now, I don't want to. I don't want to go too much, too far deeper into that. But for, for right now, we need to understand that that is, there's a lot of freedom in that place for us. Okay. God is sovereign. What we do matters. The same reason that Paul says nobody will die, but we all got to stay in the boat. Right. This is the way that I've been. This is the rhythm and the pattern that I've created for you to live in. Don't get outside of it because then you're outside of my will. Right? It's the same reason we see Nehemiah in verse 9 say we pray to our God and we set a guard as protection against them day and night. See, we have a tendency to say it this way. Look, if, if God is really protecting you, you don't need to set a guard. So, on the opposite side of that, if you're posting a guard, then you really don't believe that God is protecting you. Right? No. To both of those. Because both of those things are true. God is sovereign. Our choices absolutely matter. What we do matters. We can't just sit on our hands. Okay? We have to act. But here's the deal. Okay? When we move, when we build, we will have to battle. Okay? It, for some reason, it just seems to always be this basic principle that when you start to do um, God's work, God's way, right, you're going to get attacked spiritually. That's the bottom line. When you think about the scriptures and the story of Jesus Christ, he comes on the scene, he gets baptized with the Spirit. I mean, there's just this ultimate holy moment. You know, the sky just breaches open and the lights come down. There's the dove. We hear God say, this is my son <coughs> in whom I am well pleased. High point in scripture. Everything's about to take off. And then what happens? Right after that, he's in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. Bam. I mean, immediately. I want you to understand this. I debate on whether I'm saying this or not, but it's... This is the Christian life. That doesn't mean it's always bad, but I, I want you to think about that when you leave here. This is the Christian life. See, if we were to take some of the passages that we have been through with Nehemiah so far, when it comes to Nehemiah's prayer, we get about 10 to 12 verses. All right? Then we find somewhere around 8 verses on Nehemiah's plan what he's going to do. When it comes to his preparation, we get around 11 verses. But listen, when we, when we talk about opposition, we're going to get three straight chapters. Outside, from within, I mean, it's just three straight chapters we're going to get of opposition. Now see, the reality of what we learned from uh, chapter 4 all the way to chapter 6 is no matter how passionate you are, I mean, I get pretty passionate sometimes about things, man. I'm like, a, you know, this warrior mentality, man. I'm like, we got to go. But no matter how big our dreams are, how much we dream, and some of us, man, we dream big, big things. No matter how deep our convictions are, no how much how intentional and focused our prayers are, how much time we spend to plan and to prepare, no matter how many people that you try to actually rally and inspire uh, through this burden that God's laid on your heart, the reality is that the one thing that you're going to have to prepare for in your heart more than anything else is opposition and difficulty that is going to come. That's one thing I found in ministry, that the more intentionally you are about pursuing the gospel, the more spiritual battles begin to take place. And it comes from places that you would never imagine. If they can't get to you, then they're coming after me. And if they can't get to me, they're coming after you. 
They're going to go to everybody in your circle to do everything they can to try to distract you and suck the passion out of you in order to make you stop. That's all I want you to do. Just lay down and quit. But that's not who we are. Over and over and over, though, we see that example in Scripture, um, which is exactly what happens in verse 10 um, back in Nehemiah. Right? These two guys, Sanballat and Tobiah, um, they had no desire whatsoever for Nehemiah to accomplish what he set out to do. Right? They didn't share his vision. They didn't share his dream. And so ultimately, out of fear, what they did was they opposed him. And so anytime you set out to do something for God, you can expect that there's going to be opposition. Anytime you walk with the eyes of faith, you will be opposed by those who walk by sight. So what did Nehemiah do? Verse 15. When our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole wall, uh, whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand held on his weapon with the other. Uh, with one, I'm sorry, labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders, verse 18, had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are uh, separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. <laughs> so if I, could, if I could just sum that up, I maybe it would be like this. Faithful action. Right? Taking action by faith because of faith, which is actually what faith, when it's genuine and empowered by the Spirit, does. You can't help but have genuine faith empowered by the Holy Spirit and not act. And so what do we do? We rally together, we pray, we act faithfully according to what God's called us to, the mission of the church, equipping the saints, that's us, do the works of ministry, and that's kingdom building. Except we're not building walls like Nehemiah. We're building walls of salvation. But if we build, we are going to battle. And we battle with the shield of faith, the sword of truth. We engage the world around us with a message of love, of grace, and mercy, and forgiveness. Sometimes as individuals and as a community of faith, that means that we are going, we're going to be opposed. Not only from the outside, right, but from within. I mean, there's a, a tremendous amount of scripture that talks about that. We'll look at more of that next week. Again, I would just, to be honest, one of the, some of the greatest things I've ever experienced and seen have been in ministry. But some of the, the loneliest times that I've ever experienced where I felt far, far, far away from God, have also been in ministry. But see, we're all ministers. And we talked about that last week. We all are, are we're the priesthood of believers. We all have gifts. And the greater um, things for the gospel that we pursue, often the greater the opposition will be um, that we, we must have to face. But the great thing is that we have a Savior who understands. Right, one uh, who suffered greatly. He was rejected by his own people. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was scorned. So indeed, 2 Timothy 3, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 1 Peter 4, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. See, those are the kind of scriptures we don't really like. I understand that. But even the, the beatitude, you know, blessed are those who are persecuted. That's us. 
Sometimes the lowest valleys that we walk in seem to be in the churches to which we belong. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had like that. And it breaks my heart because we do it to ourselves so much. <coughs> but God is sovereign and he's always at work. And sure, I'm like anybody else, man. I, I like to be on the mountaintop. At least for a little while. I mean, <laughs> you know? But some of our greatest opportunities to grow come from the time that we spend in the valleys of life. God makes beauty of our ashes because we are a people who are redeemed by Christ. And because we are redeemed, right, when we struggle, we look to Him. And no one who looks to Him will be put to shame. I want to leave you um, this evening with a, one of my favorite passages. In this, uh, there's a book called The Noticers by Andy Andrews. I'll just read this and we'll pray and we'll get out of here. This guy um, in the book, uh, this is a true story. Um, he's, he lost his mom from cancer not too long after that. Um, his dad died in a car wreck. He didn't have a seatbelt on him. And this, he ended up living under a bridge by the ocean. And this guy comes along. Um, but he doesn't, and he's just real hard-hearted, you know. And so in the midst of this conversation, he's talking about uh, everything that's going on in his life. And, and he, <coughs> the gentleman responds to him. He says, think with me here. Everybody wants to be on top of the mountain. Everybody wants to be on the mountaintop. But if you remember, mountaintops are rocky and cold. There is no growth on the, on the top of a mountain. Sure, the view is great, but what's a view for? A view just gives us a glimpse of our next destination, our next target. But to hit that target, we must come off the mountain, go through the valley, and begin to climb the next slope. It is in the valley that we slog through the lush grass and rich soil learning and becoming what enables us to summit life's next peak. It may look like barren sand to you, son, but nothing could be further from the truth. I say to you that as you lay your head down tonight, you are sleeping on fertile ground. Think, learn, pray, plan, dream, for soon you will become. Let's pray. God, we love you. And we are grateful for the encouragement and the hope and the life that you give us in your word. We know that very often that as we begin to pursue you wholly in our heart, God, that we face the spiritual battles within our own self, our own life, with those around us who, who love us most. And so often, Lord, we cling to things that are worthless. In our pursuit of you, God, we are willing to take our eyes off of you for foolish things. And so I just ask that you continue to strengthen us and to equip us, Lord, to help us keep our eyes upon you, that we might um, take joy in the fruit that we see. No matter the numbers, God, but that we would walk alongside each other in joy to know that Christ is working, that lives are being healed that people are being redeemed, that the hope of the world is entering in, uh, in this world through us into the lives of others. God, that we would serve, that we would have compassion, that the gospel would be proclaimed. Again, we are grateful to be used by you as imperfect as we are. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.